Hello, everyone. Um, my name is David Robbins. I'm the general counsel. I'm the general counsel to the Rio Grande Water Conservation District. I've held that position since 1981. Uh, I started working on San Luis Valley water issues in 1975. So I'm pretty close to 50 years of working on the problems that exist within the valley, uh, both internally and dealing with uh, those from outside the valley who would like to tap our water resources. And I will speak about that uh, at, at, at the time of lunch, so I won't go into it uh, right now. I wanted to make, first first of all, I thought the the, the uh, movie was was really lovely and, and excellent and provided a lovely uh, description of how New Mexico acequia culture operates. Um, and I wanted to make just a couple of comments about some of the slides that uh, Arnie showed. Uh, the first one is always the one that I am most emphatic about because it dev I devoted two years of my life to the issue. And that is that the Baca Ranch is not a land grant, never was, never has been. Uh, the Baca float number four is a patent from the United States Congress that was given to the Baca heirs in exchange for giving up their legitimate claims to the original Baca uh, 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 the, the original Baca land grant, which was located at the location of the town site of the city of Las Vegas, New Mexico. The uh, Bacas filed and obtained a Spanish patent or grant from the king for that area. And the Hickorias uh, suggested to them that they would be better off returning to old Mexico, and they did. While they were in Old Mexico, uh, the town of Las Vegas was established and received a town grant. Under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, surveyor generals were appointed who had to confirm or deny the existence of land grants. And the particular surveyor general involved with the Baca claims determined that both the town site grant to the city of Las Vegas and the Baca grant were valid and requested that the Congress grant uh, replacement floats on non-mineral, non-inhabited land in the number of five uh, to the Baca heirs. And uh, Baca number four is one of the five floats. So it's no different than the land you serve, you, you live on. Uh, it, is, it is just different because it's such a large tract of land uh, that was patent, patented all at one time. So I, I thought that was important. The second thing I, I hope you'll all realize is that Colorado was a homeland of the Ute Indian people, and they were not appreciative of other tribes, much less European uh, people coming into their land. And there was very little settlement that occurred in Colorado, uh, west of the mountain front, until the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, when in 1850, the US Army rearranged where they thought the Ute people should be living. And when that happened, the San Luis Valley suddenly became this enormous opportunity for people to uh, settle in. And at that point in time, settlement came from the north as well as from the south. Uh, so although we're only 80 miles from Taos, our cultural history, the length of our history is shorter here uh, for reasons that relate mostly to the Indian tribe that viewed this as part of their homeland. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a minute and talk to you about compacts because we're supposed to be speaking right now about 
the history and context of the Rio Grande Compact. And Nathan and Aaron will join me in adding to this. The second thing I'd like to say is we're basically going to combine the program on the history and context as, long, as well as with a discussion of the ongoing lawsuit between the compacting states. Um, so com com a compact is one of the few constitutional agreements that exist in our country. Remember when the United States was formed, there were 13 colonies. Each colony believed they were sovereign. After the Revolutionary War, the 13 colonies agreed to the Articles of Confederation. We all remember this from eighth or ninth grade. The Articles of Confederation were a failure. Why were they a failure? They were a failure because none of the 13 colonies were willing to cede any governmental authority, any portion of their sovereignty to a federal, single federal government. And as a result, the United States turned out not to be as united or as manageable as they had hoped. So in the 1780s, they negotiated uh, the Constitution of the United States. And the way it was different from the Articles was each of the 13 colonies specifically gave up certain fundamental sovereignty principles to a federal government. Printing money, printing stamps, running the postal service, managing interstate or commerce within the colonies, raising an army. Uh, and they retained all of the rest of their sovereignty, their, their control over land and water within their boundaries. And the, 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 Congress, the, the framers of the Constitution realized that there were going to be times when two sovereigns, two states, had a conflict over some thing of common sovereignty. Originally, it was boundary lines. They did compacts on boundary lines. And I should tell you, the compact clause of the Constitution is Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3. But it... All it really says is two states or more can enter into a compact with consent of Congress. And thereafter, that compact will govern their interaction on that topic. So th there, there have been compacts since shortly after the nation was founded, mostly on boundary lines uh, and, and the operation of common ports. Uh, but... In 1922, an American, a Coloradan named Delph Carpenter said, why can't we use compacts to apportion the waters of interstate rivers? And so the first compact on interstate rivers was the Colorado River Compact. There were compacts within the next two years on the La Plata and the South Platte. Now, so... The thing I want you all to understand is a compact is a law of the state of Colorado. It's a law of the United States adopted by the Congress, and it is most importantly a contract. Why is it most important? Because contracts cannot be unilaterally modified. If you have a contract among five parties and you want to change the contract, three or four of them can't do it unless they compensate the fifth. Uh, so you basically have to have unanimity of purpose if you want to change a compact. The other thing I want you all to remember that's very important on this topic, and that is the Rio Grande at the time of the compact and for years before was fully appropriated. All of the water had been allocated and used. So any discussion of renegotiating the Rio Grande Compact means that someone, one of the three states, is going to have to give up water. There's no reason to renegotiate the compact unless you're going to shift who gets what. And that means... What you're talking about is somebody having to 
abandoned water that is currently being used by its citizens to the benefit of a neighboring state. I don't believe that is likely to occur. I certainly, for the almost 50 years that I have been representing this valley, have devoted a significant amount of time to make sure that it didn't happen to the extent that Colorado gave up a gallon. Compacts, so, are permanent. We shouldn't idly say, well, let's just amend the compact because we could just as easily get skinned in an amendment process as redress whatever unfair provision we're currently smoking about uh, and, and get it solved. So um, that's, that's sort of my suggestion there. The history of the compact, I'm gonna make just a couple of points. As it was pointed out by the previous two speakers, the water of the Rio Grande has been used successfully, uh, competently, efficiently for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, not simply by the, Span our, our, the Spanish forebearers, but also by the Puebloan peoples who in fact engaged in sophisticated agriculture. Uh, at the, Colorado uh, was slower to develop, obviously. Uh, the Ute people were not farming people. Uh, and it was only until Coloradans began, both Hispanic Coloradans and other Northern European Coloradans started moving in and developing the works that were in some of the movie pictures, uh, that there became a problem. And what was the source of the problem? Well, the United States felt that it was going to have some responsibility to Mexico. Uh, and they were getting pressure from southern New Mexico and Texas to not permit northern New Mexico and Colorado to dry up the river. By 1890, there was enough impact from northern New Mexico and, Col and Colorado on the flows of the river that by 19 1896, the federal government placed an embargo on our state and northern New Mexico, pre preventing the use of federal lands for any water resource development project. And a lot of the land was federal land at that time. Those embargoes continued until 1930. Uh, the federal government built the Rio Grande project, Elephant Butte Reservoir, in 1905 in part to settle the contentions in Southern New Mexico and Texas, and in part to provide and ensure a water supply to old Mexico. The federal government entered into a convention with the Mexican government in 1906 to provide Mexico with 60,000 acre feet of water per year. In 1929, the three states entered into a temporary compact. And that was simply a mechanism by which the three states agreed to a status quo standstill agreement to allow the collection of more data. In 1936 and 37, the National Resources Committee, a federal committee made up of what would now be the Bureau of Reclamation, the USGS, the Soil Conservation Service, NRCS. All of those agencies poured people into the Rio Grande Valley and studied every acre of land that could possibly be irrigated. They counted every well. They measured every single ditch. They drew enormous maps that many of you have seen. And they did that to provide an absolute certainty what was going on in the Rio Grande north of Fort Quitman, Texas. Why Fort Quitman? That's where the Rio Grande disappears and doesn't reappear again until the Conchos River flows north out of Mexico to provide the water that is then depended upon 
through Great Bend National Park and all the way to Brownsville. That portion of the river is allocated not by the convention of 1906, but by the treaty of 1944 between the US and Mexico, which also covers the Tijuana River and the Colorado River. So when we hear Rio Grande and US-Mexican relations, we have to constantly remember the Rio Grande below Fort Quitman is a totally different river than the one which we depend upon. Uh, so in 1938, the three states signed a compact. It was approved by the Congress of the United States and it has remained effectively unchanged ever since. It is a genius compact, right? Because it contains tables of relationship for each of the states. Uh, the first table is Article 3, which is a curvilinear function for the state of Colorado that says the more water that comes out of the mountains each year, the more you have to send down to New Mexico. And, our, and, and, and that there is a table for both the Rio Grande main stem and for the Canaas, okay? And the purpose of those tables is to keep Colorado's consumptive use of water the same. So if we have a big year, we can't just grab all the water. If we have a low year, we don't have to pretend it's a big year and deliver more than is actually available. It's a very good compact in that way, very fair. And New Mexico has a similar table in Article 4, and that table captures both the flows of the Chama and the main stem Colorado and provides a delivery responsibility to Elephant Butte Reservoir. Now, as to New Mexico below the reservoir, below Elephant Butte and West Texas, instead of a table of relationship, the compact framers used the, 19, the, the Rio Grande project, which was built in 1905, round numbers. And they simply provided for a delivery of an average or normal delivery of 790,000 acre feet a year to that whole area. And the US uh, government uh, then through the Bureau of Reclamation divided that between the two irrigation districts and water users below Elephant View. Uh, so it just works slick until uh, 2013 when Texas sued New Mexico. And Texas sued New Mexico for the very reason that we have all sort of pulled, either pulled all of our hair out or had it turn white. And that is the development of the turbine pump and the capacity to tap the aquifer systems under the floor of the entire Rio Grande system, not just the San Luis Valley. And New Mexico moved its agriculture in the, you know, between 1995 and 2013, from what was predominantly a annual crop culture, not just Southern New Mexico, but Texas, where people grew stuff like alfalfa, chili peppers, you know, you name it, stuff that if there was no water, you didn't plant that year. And they put in pecan forests beyond all belief. And pecan trees, like all trees, can't survive a year in an arid climate without receiving irrigation. And as a result, when there was insufficient water in Elephant Butte, the farmers who had invested millions in the pecan forests panicked and put in wells. And as they pumped the groundwater to keep their pecans alive, the water coming from Elephant Butte didn't flow down to Texas the way it used to, instead, infiltrated into the ground to fill up the hole that was created by the wells to water the pecans, making it impossible for, in the vision of the Bureau of Reclamation 
for reclamation to deliver sufficient water to the people in Texas to which they were entitled. And so uh, that takes us to the question, uh, the second discussion before I sit down here. The ongoing lawsuit is just about that. Hey, it's Texas v. New Mexico slash Colorado subdistricts. That's all it is. How do you deal with junior groundwater rights that are disrupting the normal flow, surface flow of rivers and streams within the Rio Grande Basin? They did not have the strength of purpose of the Colorado irrigators. They did not and could not rely on it. The Colorado irrigators to their en enormous credit, were willing to agree that we don't like this, but you know what? We've overrun the rabbit, and we have to fix it. And you set about, it may be, it clearly is imperfect, but you set about trying to, to develop a program by which the individual farmers and their neighbors could take responsibility for the fact that our aquifer systems had been mined during the dry periods in the early late 90s, early 2000s, and that had to be replenished. And you have pers persisted for 20 years in your effort to accomplish that to your great credit. Now, the difference and the reason for the lawsuit is that that didn't happen in New Mexico. And it took 10 years and a whole lot of arm twisting, partly by Colorado, which got dragged into the lawsuit as a party to the compact. But what happened in Texas v. New Mexico was that ultimately New Mexico and Texas, as I said, with a little nudging from your attorneys general, agreed that Article 3 and Article 4 worked super. Colorado and New Northern New Mexico know exactly what they have to do each year to comply with the compact. They can look at the snow courses, they can look at the flows at their gauges, they know how much Craig described this morning. I'm going to have a 20% cut on the canals. Why? Because he knows that with the snowpack and the runoff conditions he's going to get, he's going to need extra water to make sure he gets the canal share to the Las Asas gauge. And that's what we do. They didn't do that down there. But they, they said, you know, this really works slick. So the stipulation was that they would put a compact gauge at the Texas-New Mexico state line. And they would measure how much water came out of Elephant Butte. And then they would assign a percentage of that that Texas was entitled to. The states said, we don't care where it comes from, Bureau or Southern New, Mex Southern New Mexican irrigators. We just know that if that flow is at that gauge, Texas has received what it was entitled to in 1938. It's exactly what the U.S. Supreme Court has been begging states to do for the last 40 years, where I have been intimately involved in cases before that court. And this is the first time that three states have looked the court in the eye and said, we accept the challenge. Instead of further litigation, we'll settle. And what happened? The United States, which had been admitted as a party, challenged the three-state stipulation. Why? Because with a gauge at the Texas line, they couldn't screw around with Elephant Butte anymore, in my opinion. All right? It's... But there's, it's the only rational explanation. 
why would the federal government, which effectively has nothing to do with the sovereign decisions of the three states, how they're going to divide up their water, why would they want to involve themselves? And it's because of the ongoing fight over federalism. What exactly does the federal government have an entitlement to do over the wishes of individual states. And that's what the argument was about. That's what the, the, the whole current ongoing controversy is about. Um, I believe, again, simply me, and remember, you can disagree with me. I respect that enormously, but you're not going to get me to change my point of view unless you have one hell of a good argument. My belief is that the federal agencies want and need to be able to have greater control over the rivers of the West as things dry out, because they may want to accomplish purposes that the states don't necessarily agree with or one or more of the states don't agree with. And so if they can convince the court to say that they can decide where the water goes coming out of Elephant Butte and an agreement among the three states doesn't matter, they can apply that same rationale to the Colorado River where they control two of the biggest reservoirs and where there is great controversy between all seven of those states. And it is an existential threat to the state of Colorado if they are successful. So I want you all to just perceive that there's a hell of a lot more going on out there than just a, a lawsuit between Texas and New Mexico, right? We're not fighting about water for chilies or water for pecans or water for the city of El Paso. We're fighting about a very important constitutional question, which is driven by what is the extent of state sovereignty versus the responsibilities of the federal government. Makes it fun. So, right? And you know, Nathan joined me at the Supreme Court, as did Amber, uh, as did Heather Dutton, and we enjoyed the argument um, sometimes. Uh, but that, that's what the second topic is sort of about. I'm going to sit down. I've got more stuff to sh shriek about, but I can, I can do it to spoil your lunch. So I'll turn it over to Nathan and then, and then Aaron. Well, I'm Aaron Binks. I'm with uh, U.S. Senator Michael Bennett's office out of Alamosa. And um, I think I'm here on the panel today. Uh, first of all, I had the privilege of being a student of David uh, as a staffer off and on since 2007, and many of you in the room. So I think I'm on the panel today mostly to offer a perspective as a congressional staffer, the role that your congressional delegation may play in federal issues and the compact generally and how to support the state. Uh, I think we're getting low on time. And so I do just want to be sure and acknowledge I am one of two staffers here in the San Luis Valley. We also have Azrael Madrigal there in the audience and she's with Senator Hickenlooper's office if you just want to wave. Um, we are resources for all of you to understand how and where the senators may be involved in particular water matters. But I think it's safe to assume that unless our bosses are hearing from David, or other key players on interstate issues, we try to stay informed and stay out of the way of where the states need to go on water issues. That's probably my biggest challenge and my biggest duty as, a, as, an, as an advisor to Senator Bennett on water is to stay as informed as I possibly can and to know how to protect the key role that we need to play, but also frankly to advise people to, to not idealize and simplify that we can just reopen the compact and find a way to save water. It's just, it's a dangerous place to go. So that's why I'm here. I'm, I'm available afterwards. So I'll hand you to Nathan. Oh, thank you. 
Nathan Combs, I'm the manager of the Canales Water Conservancy District. Uh, I've been there since 2009. And uh, I have to say, honestly, I've never disagreed with David for obvious reasons. Um, so, um, you know, the Canales does have its own issues with the compact, but one of the biggest lessons I think we all have to take away from this is when we have some of these issues, these are growing pains. These aren't real issues, right? The compact is pretty, it's a pretty solid instrument as, as David very eloquently demonstrated. Our issues are how do we grow our water demands and our civilization demands and just the changing climate to accommodate that limitation on consumptive use. And so I, I would I would encourage us as we move forward in any compact discussion or water allocation discussion to keep in mind that none of us are more important than the other. And so we are gonna be able to work this out if we'll just keep the constant out there that some of our basics are set, we will get our water. It may be different this year than it was last year, but our job is to be commodus and to, to make it work within the framework that we have now. Um, Nick, I know we have some people wanting to participate by Zoom, so I'll just uh, thank you for the invite to be here. And I think the keynote speech that David's going to give us at lunch will be well worth our time. So thank you. See, I, I'm sorry I hogged all the time. I had one more thing I wanted to say. If you ever see former Representative Ed Vigil and you care very much about the Asakia tradition in Southern Colorado, which I know many of you do passionately. Uh, Ed carried the Asakia Recognition Act in 2009. Uh, he identified very early on that as people became interested in their Asakias and the way in which they're managed, and it was not, in his view, properly recognized by Colorado statute. So he came to a, a guy with a mustache that he had known for many years and said, can you help me put something together that will move us in this direction? And the Asakia Recognition Act is what came out of Ed's and my efforts to allow uh, the citizens of the state of Colorado living under Asakias to manage them in a way that fit with their traditions and culture. So thank him if you see him. <laughs>